Bank one matrices with mismatched. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'll be I'll be um, presenting some recent work that I've been working on with um, Elise, Lenka, and Florent. Oh, I'll be presenting some recent work I've been working on with um, Elise, Lenka, and Florent, and it's related to estimating um, rank one matrices. And in particular, I'll be focusing on two problems. One is universality, and the other one is large deviations. So um, I'll first begin by introducing the um, general setup for this um, inference problem. Um, since I'm a mathematician, I will sort of also go over how I see the theory of large, of large deviations. I will go over the main results and how large deviations sort of connect to this Bayesian inference problem. Um, as well, because I'm a mathematician, I'm obligated to tell you at least some ideas of the proof. And at the end, I will sort of, div div end with some open problems and what is next with respect to these problems. Okay. So, let's, so let's start by defining the model that we'll be working with. Um, let's consider a, a very simple and a, a somewhat uh, generic inference problem. So this inference problem is I want to infer some signal. So I'm, I, my signal has a very specific structure. It's a rank one matrix of dimension n by n. And it will it, be generated by the outer product of a vector with iid entries. So this vector x0 will encode my signal matrix. And it's a vector in Rn, and all of my entries will be generated independently from this probability measure P0. And I'm going to observe a noisy version of this signal. So what do I mean by a noisy version of this signal? Well, my noisy version will be a matrix Y, which is another n by a matrix, but its, its entries will be generated randomly, independently, and conditionally on my signal matrix that I wanted to, to, to observe. So my, my matrix Y, I'm going to assume that it, that it will be symmetric because my signal will be, um, since my signal is also um, symmetric. And these entries of Y will be generated from some output channel. I'm going to denote it by this conditional probability measure with this subscript out on the bottom. And it's going to be generated conditionally on my signal. And there's a funny little normalization term on, the, on my matrix. This is there just because this is the right scale to look at things so that the problem isn't too hard and the problem isn't too easy. It's sort of the, the right scale where interesting things happen. And a classical example of something that falls under this somewhat generic framework is the um, spike matrix problem. So let's assume my signal is a random rank one matrix. And I'm going to generate my data Y conditionally on my signal in the following form. I'm going to generate it from a standard normal, um, for, not a standard normal, from a normally distributed random variable with mean given by the corresponding entry of my signal with variance one. And this, this is um, equal in law as Y is um, equal to some additive Gaussian noise added to some normalized version of my signal matrix. Okay. So my goal or my problem is I want to somehow estimate or I want to guess what this signal matrix is from my observation. And classically, what's a nice guess for what, my, for what the best estimator will be? Well, one way is out of all the possible functions of my data, I want my estimator to minimize some, some error. One, one thing we could do is, well, on average, I want to minimize the um, differences of the squares of each of these entries of this matrix on average. And the best estimator will be given by the, um, by the um, conditional expected value of my x0 given my, my data y. So moving forward, I sort of want to understand what this conditional expectation is, because this will be the object that will minimize the mean squared error in this problem. Okay. Um, associated to this problem is the um, conditional probability measure. And by Bayes' theorem, we have all the parts to sort of have a very nice explicit form for it. So we can write the conditional probability that my, um, X, that my signal matrix is equal to any particular value conditionally on my observations y. I can use Bayes' theorem to write it as some ratio. And I can use independence to write it as some product of all the entries of, of, these, of, of, these, ent of these objects. And this P0x is, is a um, product measure. I just, I just did not put the um, tensor on the top to simplify some notation. 
And related to this posterior probability, which is related to the optimal estimator, is another quantity. This um, statistic, we're going to call it the overlap. And this overlap will be defined as the inner products between two vectors. One vector is my original x0 vector, which was what appeared in the signal. And the other one is the inner product with my, with my guess, so a, a um, sample from my posterior probability measure from this G optimal that I'm going to call it. And I'm going to take the inner product between these two objects, and this sort of loosely measures how close my estimator is to the original signal. So sort of the magnitude of this corresponds to how many entries that I've, that I've guessed correctly, or, or what's the angle between my estimator and the original signal I want to guess. And this, this parameter, or this um, statistic, is a very fundamental object in that if I want to compute interesting quantities, such as the free energy, the minimal mean squared error, this behavior of this overlap sort of encodes the order parameters for these models. So I'm going to be a bit more precise, so hopefully I can now motivate where does this overlap appear and why is it somewhat, somewhat interesting. Um, I'm just going to return to the spike matrix example because everything's simple and explicit for this problem. Um, from this model, I have an explicit formula for the posterior, as mentioned before. I can write down what this is, so in, instead of some general formulas, I now have a somewhat explicit, um, explicit form for this um, conditional probability measure. And um, if I expand it out, then, then there's going to be a term, this, Hamilt this Hamiltonian, which will, will, uh, will appear in the exponent minus some term that only depends on y. We don't really we don't have to worry about it since it will sort of cancel with the um, factors on top. And associated with, with this is some called the free energy, which is 1 over n, the expected value of the log of the normalization term in this probability measure subtracted the terms that only depend on y. And this should just be the hn of x in the exponent here. And this quantity, this free energy, sort of encodes the behaviors for this conditional probability. And that if I, um, take, if I take derivatives with respect to the lambda parameter, I can recover certain moments of, of the, the term that sort of encodes the behavior of this probability. And um, classically, this lemma of the free energy was uh, proven. It's, um, it's proven by Lelarge and Milan as given as some um, variational problem. It's given by the supremum over some parameter of an explicit function that, that um, depends on the prior in some very specific way. And these overlaps are sort of um, important. Is, um, in, these, in these types of models, we observe something called overlap concentration. So the behaviors of these overlaps in the high dimensional limit they sort of um, average or they sort of concentrate on its expected value. This was proven for, uh, in, in general after a small perturbation to this, to this Giz measure by um, Jean. And from here, we're sort of able to, um, we have some really nice behaviors of these overlaps for these problems. And this parameter Q that, uh, that appears in this, in this optimization problem, this some Q corresponds to the expected value of the overlap up to some, up to some smoothing of the of the, of the Gibbs measure. So this is the classical setting, and this is a um, classical result for um, spiked um, matrices. We're gonna move on to a slightly more challenging setting. Um, this is more realistic setting in the sense that if you have a normal statistician like myself, I might not know what the prior is, I might not know how the data is, is um, generated, so I will make my own model and from here, I can build another, another, another conditional probability measure that might not be the right one. So this Y here was generated from the P0 and the PL that I defined way back. But I'm going to build my own model since I don't know what this is exactly. I have some guess on what the prior is. I have some guess on what the, on what the output is. And I can, define a, a, I can define the associated probability measure with these guesses. And again, I can look at what the overlap is. It is it's going to be the inner product between maybe not the optimal estimator, but some estimator based on my best guess, and the original signal that we saw before. And um, this mishmash setting is, has been um, studied recently by many people in this, in this room, in particular Jean Barbier and Francesco uh, 
Francesca Camellia, Camelli, uh, Marco, and um, Manuel. So this is a um, somewhat more complicated setting for um, inference. It will be called the mismatch setting. And again, let's just do a concrete example to, uh, to uh, um, demonstrate these ideas. So let's return to the spike matrix example. And let's say that I know that my data is generated from some, from some spike um, Gaussian additive noise, but I don't know what the prior is, so I'm going to guess. My guess is my um, signal will be generated with taking values plus one, minus one, with probability one half. I can build my conditional probability measure. And again, I want to understand what's the free energy for these models, for, for example. And the only difference here is my PX here is um, different than the P0 that appeared before. And this, this um, limit of a free energy was um, proven by um, Francesco and the um, co-authors. So this limit of this free energy is given by some, again, some other variational formula. And this variational formula in this mismatch setting is already much more complicated than what we had before. There was some explicit term that appeared over there. Now I won't, I won't go over what this is, but it will be the um, solution to the um, SK model at some external field and some temperature beta. I will make it a bit more precise later once I, once I explain the other results, but there's some, ex, there's some explicit formula for it. It's a bit more complicated, and, and I just want to show this just because in the mismatch setting, even the limited free energy becomes much more complicated for these problems. And now you're probably wondering, or why am I focusing on all of these spike matrix to these models? Um, they are nice examples because objects are, are explicit, but how is this related to the general inference problem that we were interested in or that I, that I was interested or that I introduced at the beginning? And this connection will be connected through something called the universality of the overlaps. And I'm going to be a bit more precise about what I mean about universality. And before I could explain what this universality is, I want to introduce or at least review what large deviations are. So, or at least large deviations in the context for these inference problems. So, suppose we're back in the optimal case. I know that my overlaps concentrate. And if my overlaps concentrate, let's say I want to say something a bit more precise than, than just concentration. Let's say I want to find some estimate on what's the probability that my overlap deviates from, its, from the value that it concentrates on. So let's say I want to compute what's the probability that my random overlap deviates from its, um, from its expected value. And, and I want to sort of make this precise with two parameters. So I want to find out how fast is this exponential, exponential decay. So I want to find out what's the exponent on, this, on the exponential decay. And I also want to find out well, what's, the, what's the coefficient in front. And this coefficient can also depend on DMT. So this is some form of concentration in inequality. We sort of want to find out what's the probability that, it's, that it sort of deviates from its expected value. And large, and large deviations, you can think of it as a more precise version of this. So I want to classify for any rare event A. I want to find some, some constant and some speed so that I want to compute what's the probability that my overlap lies within this set, and this, this set, I want, to, I want to, instead of an less than or um, equal to, I want to sort of approximate equality, at least up to the first order. And if I take one over n to the alpha and the logs of um, both sides, it sort of means I want to compute probabilities of this form. So can I compute what's the probability that my overlap takes a certain value? We know that it um, concentrates, but at finite n, this is still a random object. So I want to see, well, what's the probability that it, that it takes, some, takes some value? And this n of alpha and the speed sort of encodes, can sort of encodes what this value is. So, um, all of these objects can be encoded by something called the rate function and the speed. And this is encoded for something called the large deviations principle. So, we'll say that the sequence of measures, in our case, our sequence of measures will be the laws of these overlaps under, the, under, some, under some posterior measure, either the optimal one or the one from mismatch. So, I want to understand the laws of these overlaps, and it's encoded by two objects. One is the rate function. This rate function is a nice function. It's lower semi-continuous. 
if it is a even better rate function, if it's a good rate function, then all of its level sets are also compact. So there's some, there's some nice function i, and there's a function a of n, which encodes our speed. And basically what this is is the log of the probability we had before will be upper and lower bounded by some infimums over the sets of this rate function. And the intuition, or how we can think of what this rate function is, is um, the formula we had before of it, the lemma one over n of the log of the probability of a set A is given by the negative infimum over the set. Well, on one end, the one over n log of the probability is like the integral of my measure. And on the other hand, when a n is big, then you would expect that this integral on the right-hand side will um, concentrate on the, near on the maximizers of i of x in the set A, which is precisely what we have here, or the minimizers, I guess, in this case, because it's minus sign. So um, this rate function i is sort of the density function corresponding to the mu of n. So you can think of this i of x as sort of encoding the probabilities of these rare events in some simple way. So this rate function encodes everything that we need to know about understanding these rare events. And a classical example for this, or a concrete example, is, um, is, um, is um, Cremere's theorem, which tells us the behaviors of a certain statistic. So let's take IID and IID random variables and want to compute what the sample mean is. In this case, we know that the sample mean concentrates by the law of large numbers. And we have an explicit formula for the probability that the sample mean deviates, or the sample mean takes certain values. So this rate function will be given as the log of the expected value of its moment generating function. Um, you could take its um, Legendre transform, which will be the supremum of its um, convex of this, of lambda of x minus the, uh, to, minus the log moment generating function. And this, this uh, Legendre transform of the log moment generating function encodes the probabilities for these rare events. As in, it was um, given as the, as the supreme over sets in the sets that we are interested in. Okay, so, so, so this lambda star will be the rate function for sums of ID random variables. And this has a direct application to what we had before in the sense that let's say I have perfect information and my estimator is precisely what my x zero is. In this case, my overlap just becomes the sums of the entries of my um, signal vector squared. And this is the sum of IID variables because I'm assuming that the entries of my signal are um, IID. So Cremere's team actually tells us what the, what the large deviations are for this overlap. It says that the log of the probability of my overlap takes a value in um, any set, will be upper and lower bounded by the infimums of this rate function. Say by some supreme of some parameter lambda minus some um, log moment generating function. And this form will be important to remember for the results of say later on. And now, I guess the question is, well, can we generalize this result when the case where my overlap has a very simple structure to the case when my estimators are from these general probabilities that we observed before. And now I guess I'll be explaining what the main results are, at least what we managed to show. So um, the first result is a universality result um, to go in line with the topics or the theme of this conference. So I'm just gonna define a few, a few objects. So I'm gonna define two log likelihoods. One log likelihood is the log likelihood of my of how the data was generated. And the other one, G, without the zero, is the log likelihood of my uninformed guess on what I think this log likelihood is. I'm gonna find three, three um, different parameters, I'm gonna call them Fisher score parameters, that they're just functions of average over my data Y, assuming no signal. So I guess this is sort of the behavior of the way my data is generated in the absence of any signal. So in, this, in the spike matrix model, this would be like average over standard normals. Because when there's no um, signal, then you just have the additive Gaussian noise. And you have these three parameters that sort of only depend on the first and second derivatives of my log likelihood functions and the inner products between them. And in the simple case, when our guess is perfect, so in the Bayesian optimal case, when my, when my guess for the log likelihood and the actual log likelihood are the same, then all these parameters are actually all encoded by one parameter called lambda. But in the mismatch case, these parameters may be different. And 
I could define two likelihood functions. So one likelihood function is the, is the um, or one probability measure will be the probability measure that we observed before, just some normalization by something that only depends on y. I'm just going to in, in include that here, or I'm going to subtract it off since, since we need some extra normalization. And the other probability measure, so this gn of y is the probability measure corresponding to the original inference problem. And this other probability measure, z n of beta, or gn of beta, will be a um, the Gaussian measure corresponding to what appeared to be in, this, in the spike matrix problem we had before, except lambda parameters are replaced by these three temperature parameters we had before. And this, and this model, this Hamiltonian, isn't new. This has been, um, this is precisely the model studied in the work by, uh, by um, Francesco. And we're just looking at the Gibbs measure for this model. So here's our result for universality. So we're going to have to assume a few things. Um, they could probably be weakened, but um, I'm going to assume that the, that the way the data is generated and my uninformed prior, I'm going to assume those are compactly supported. I need to assume sufficient regularity on my log likelihood, so it has to be at least three times differentiable, and there's also some bounds on the, um, on the, third, on the third derivative. There's some funny condition, as I need some consistent estimator, estimator uh, condition, and the intuition for this is, um, at least in the spike matrix model, in the absence of a, of a signal, I know that my data is generated centered, so my additive noise is centered. It means that as the, um, as the uh, if I make my guess of how the data is generated, it also has to be centered. So I have to preserve the mean somehow. So that's the intuition behind what this consistent estimator um, condition is. And I'll be looking at the joint law of two statistics. So one is the overlap that we saw before, which is our inner product between our signal and my estimator. And I'm also gonna have some R11 overlap, the self overlap, which is just the length of my, of my um, sample. The reason why I want to, want to look at the joint law of um, both of these objects is the value of the norm, or the norm of this x sort of encodes the behavior of this overlap. So if my vector x is very small, then my overlap would naturally take very small values just by the Cauchy-Schwartz in, e, in equality. And I sort of want the overlap to sort of measure how close we are. I don't want this magnitude to be really influenced by the size of the vector. So one way is I can like normalize it by the overlap, or I can just look at the um, look at the um, joint law together. So what my what the large deviations result says is that um, if I take my beta parameter to be encoded by the Fisher score parameters I defined before, which is the expected values of the partials of the log of the log likelihoods. So my betas take this very specific values we saw before, then the joint law of the overlaps under the original Gibbs measure and under the Gibbs measure that we saw, the, um, that we saw with the um, beta hat parameters, they satisfy the same almost sure large deviations principle. So the probability of these very events are the same and it's almost sure large deviations principle because these probability measures are actually random. They, they are, they um, depend on the, the they, they are generally conditioning on the Y. So almost surely, no matter how we, um, how we uh, generate them, they satisfy the same large deviations principle. So they have the same probabilities, rare events. And you also get for free that the free energies are the same for these, for these um, inference models. Okay, so that's the universality part, is that these spike matrix models that I introduced as toy models are precisely what we want to look at. And the next object is, well, can we compute what this rate function is? And now I will sort of go over what this P symbol we saw before. So um, this P symbol is, can be defined, or this Parisi functional can be defined with um, two, two um, sequences of, of, um, of um, parameters. There's some explicit form. And I don't want to go too much into um, detail of how this formula looks like, but I just want to point out that if you recall what the, what the um, Cremere's theorem was, there was a infimum over lambda and mu of some linear part minus the log moment generating function of some object. So this is the linear part and this is the log moment generating function of the other object. So from Cremere's point of view, it's sort of generalizing the large deviations principle to when I have some extra terms in the exponent corresponding to my new Gibbs measure. And if you're from a spin loss point of view, you can think of this as the standard Parisi formula but since I have some probability here, I have some extra 
part that sort of is, is, is influenced by the probability of this event. And this is the, um, the um, Kramer's theorem part. So you can think of it as some spin glass part added to it the, um, the um, Kramer's theorem part, or the Kramer's theorem part, you just add to it some spin glass part. If you're unfamiliar with either one, there's just some explicit rate functional that we have. And um, this is just to make things precise. This is a possible domain of all the overlaps. So if I take linear products of my overlap and my self overlap, the possible values are sort of bounded within some set. So, so these, are, these are possible values of my overlap. They can't take all values since they're generated from probabilities with, um, with, um, with um, certain assumptions I just support. So, so the minimum max values have to take certain values, and the C encodes the sets of um, possible values. And our result is, well, we have a almost sure large, a large deviations principle for the Gibbs measures. So the joint law under our uh, general beta parameters, so for any choice of beta parameters, it doesn't even have to be the special ones, but for any choice of beta parameters, um, I will have a rate function, which is given by the negative of the function that we had before and the supremum over its possible values. So this rate function will be infinite if my values of my overlap, S and M, are not within its feasible values, which means that I'm just taking the log of a zero, so it will be negative infinity. And if it is in the set of possible values, then it's, um, then it's large deviations or it's, or it's rate function, the probability of, of rare events will be encoded by this rate function here. And it's almost sure in the sense that this gives measures random, but for almost all realizations of W and X zero, we have a, we have that it satisfies the same um, rate function. So this random probability measure holds, this result holds almost surely for this randomly generated functions, um, Gibbs functions. And as a um, consequence, if I take my betas to correspond to the parameters we had before, um, we have a formula for the rate function. I can also take rectangular sets to optimize over the self-overlap if, if, you, if you don't want. So I have the large deviations of these overlaps from the inference problems that I had before. So almost surely for all observations from my Y, I have some, as I have some rate function that's given by the same object as the beta parameters we had before. Okay. And as another free result we get, we could compute the limit of the free energy we sort of get the limit of the free energy for free just by optimizing over the rate functions. And if I know my rate function has a unique minimizer at some S and some M, then I know that my overlaps will converge to S and M almost surely. So we have another way to show concentration for these models just by looking at the minimizers of these rate functions. Okay. So um, those were the main Results. It was basically um, it was basically saying that um, the inference problems or these overlaps generated from these general inference problems are the same as the overlaps generated from these spike problems with a very specific choice of beta parameters, and we also have a function that encodes the probabilities of these rare events. So we know that these overlaps, at least, they're universal in the sense that their rare events are given by the same by the same types of rate functions. And these are almost sure large divergence principles. Okay. So um, I have 12 minutes to go over some ideas of the proof. And I think I will just have time to go over the ideas of the universality part. And um, what I'll do is um, I'll first show a quenched universality part. And then to get to something that's almost sure, um, we we use um, basically some concentration and I guess precise estimates on all of the errors to sort of go from quench to almost sure. So the log of the free energy behaves close to, the, to its expected value. Um, this, this, the, the object without the, the expected value and the object with the expected value will be, will be close. So, so we could just study the expected value for now. Basically, to show universality, I want to show that these logs of these probabilities, this is just the um, top term in the Gibbs measure. For any set A, I want to show that this log of this probability of the object on top is, is, um, can be reduced to the log of the probability of this e to the Hamiltonian of these three beta parameters on the bottom. So how will we do that? Well, um, 
because I assume enough regularity on my G, I can take some first, first, and second, first and second derivatives. And because of the normalization on my xi, x, xj, I can throw out the third order term because this is of higher order. I guess this is, will be of um, order n, and this will be of, of smaller order. So we could just ignore this. So I've basically reduced my Hamiltonian to some object that depends on the first, <laughs> first derivative and the second, and the second, um, second derivative. Next, to simplify it some more, I can use concentration. And the fact that I guess this random coefficient, the second order term, it will be cave close to its expected value. So we can use some matrix concentration in E equalities, replace that second term with this beta parameter that we had before. This is precisely how we define the beta parameter in the, uh, in the, uh, the second term. And now we just have to deal with this first term in this object. And this first term in this object is um, IID. We assume that my entries were generally IID. So this is just some IID random variable um, times some XI, XJ. And I know that perhaps in the very, the very large end, this will probably behave like a standard normal, or not a, not a standard normal, but some normal with some shift. So um, you could compute what the mean is of this object. You get some beta parameter. You could compute what the variance is. You will get the other beta parameter. And you can use universality of universality in disorder for spin glasses because you just have the IAD entry times xi xj. You can unravel it to say that I guess I could replace this with the equivalent Gaussian model. And from here, just log of this free energy is um, the term in the exponent was precisely the H beta parameter that we had before. So this, this holds for all A, so it shows that at least quenched all of these, all of these all these trans free energies, all of these um, conditional free energies sort of reduced to the same thing up to some, up to some little o, little small O error that sort of goes to zero in the, in the limit. And since in the large division period we take n to infinity, that's, that's, that's really all we, all, we, all we care about. Okay. And now I wanted to go over the proof for the large deviations. Um, maybe I will just say a few a few um, quick words about it is that these conditional probab these co these free energies conditioned on some values of these overlaps. These are called the France Parisi France Parisi um, France Parisi potentials, and the log of the probabilities that we wanted to study before these overlaps can be just written as the um, difference between the France Parisi potential and the free energy, which is without this without this. Um, this um, extra extra conditioning. So I could write these these objects I wanted to compute for the um, large deviations large deviations principle as the um, difference between two log partition functions. One is conditioned on the overlaps taking some values, and the other one is not conditioned on the overlaps taking certain values. And I guess you could use Varda and Zama and just say, well, these these are quantities, I could just take them equal to zero, I could add them in later. So if you notice in the rate function, there were some some simple parameters that disappeared at the end, those are what you get when you just add them back in. So to prove this, we really only have to look at the behaviors of these Gibbs measures under the first term. Um, by universality, studying these, these, these Gibbs measures will, um, will um, basically give us the um, large deviations of the object that we had, that we were interested in at the start. And because the free energy is concentrated by, um, by some concentration, we are able to just look at the quenched ones. So we're able to average over the randomness in, these, in the way these measures are, are defined, and then get the almost sure, almost sure object afterwards. But this is a bit easier said than done, since these, this indicator function is not really smooth with respect to x0, so the concentration here is actually a bit more delicate to show. So um, to, to go from quenched to almost sure, we requires a, a, a bit of work. Um, let's see, so it's six minutes to lunch and this will take too long. So um, I'll just ignore what the um, ideas are for this object. Um, but um, maybe a, uh, a, um, a um, very quick word on, on how, um, how um, this is proved. Um, this is, I guess, this proof of this was um, sort of generalizing the work on large, on large deviations by my supervisor, um, Dmitry Panchenko, back in, 
back in my um, PhD thesis. So he was sort of proving, uh, he, he sort of proved a large deviation principle for the self-overlaps, and what we did was we added in what happens when you add in the R10 overlap, and this introduced some extra challenges in the sense that, I guess, there's some, there, we lose some smoothness by adding this, this indicated function, so you can smooth objects out in a, in a um, nice way. You can also add a um, perturbation to our probability measures without changing the large deviations principle. So at the scale that we're looking at, we can smooth out our measures a bit, so we can get optometricity on the nice things that, we, that come with it. Um, I can use the um, caveat combinations to prove the lower bound, and then I can use the ideas to prove Cremere's theorem. I guess it's a bit more complicated, but um, you could you you could basically use um, some tools from large some large uh, deviations to sort of finish the proof for the, the lower bound. And you, you can also go from quench to, to almost sure if we were a bit more careful with all the estimates. Okay. So future problems, what are we interested in in the future? So some natural que questions are, can we generalize this to higher rank models? Um, this was sort of done for, um, done for the classical spike matrix models. Can we generalize similar results to, instead of the rank one case, can we go to the higher rank case? There's also the question is, um, can we go to the tensor case? So instead of a xi, x, xj, can we assume that our rank one model is basically generated by some tensors, or the, if we look at the corresponding p-spin models for these objects. Another assumption is, well, we assume that these yijs are sort of generated independently, and they had the same law, um, iid. So can we generalize this to when there's um, the, the different, different um, posteriors for each i and j, and these are the um, hetero, heterogeneous models that have been studied by the works of Reeves and Francesco. And lastly, um, we have some rate functions. We can study the phase, the phase transitions for these models. We can study, well, when is the replica symmetry breaking? When do these objects concentrate? When, do it has, when does it have a um, unique minimizer? So we haven't done that yet. We just have a um, rate function. There's still lots to understand about the behaviors of these overlaps under these, um, these um, rate functions. And um, I guess we have some time for questions. Or not, then there'll be time for lunch. Yes, yeah, so thank you for your time. But thank you very much, Justin. Is there? Yes. Uh, thank you. It was a very nice talk. Okay, so one thing that I didn't get is uh, what was the the mismatch scheme on the likelihood, the probability of the data given the signal. What was the assumption on that one? Oh, um, what were the uh, assumptions on the guesses for this mismatch? Yes. I see. So um, one assumption is um, I needed my guess for the prior to be compactly supported. This can probably likely be weakened. Um, the other assumption is for our mismatch is I need enough regular I need some smoothness, so I need the um, the, um, the, the, the log likelihoods to be differentiable enough times. And the last uh, estimate, or the last condition I need on what my guess is for this, is um, I need the, this, this quantity to be equal to, to zero. And the way that I would like to interpret this, or at least um, in this, in the simple case, this, this, um, the, what this condition means, it means that um, in my original model, if my original model without any signal, so my structure, my noise, if my noise was centered, then it means that if I'm basically guessing how my how my um, observations will be uh, um, will be um, generated, I still also need my noise to be centered. So I also need I also need um, Need them to hold true because if this was not if if this was not zero, then there will be an extra mean mean there will be an extra mean term that sort of is of high order than um, than everything else. We'll, we'll have a slightly different problem, and a um, comment is in the optimal case this if we have the right if we choose the right um, log likelihood 
this object would be zero automatically. So um, this, is, this is sort of um, automatically satisfied for the Bayesian optimal cases, and it's an, it's an extra assumption you need. So it's basically saying that my, that my statistician's guess cannot be really wrong. I need, I need to at least match, match the means of the noise. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. Okay, the intuition behind the, the second overlap term, can you just share the idea about it? Yes. Oh, so what's the intuition behind this, um, second, this second overlap? Um, I guess we don't have to understand the, um, the uh, um, joint laws. If I want to only understand the, or the original overlap, I could also just, just look at that. But suppose we want something a bit more precise, this overlap. We want this to sort of encode how, how close our guess was. We want to sort of encode the angle behind this. And in order for us to encode the angle, I have to sort of normalize by the lengths of these vectors. So I sort of have to control the lengths of these, of these estimates. And I guess if, if I, in some in cases, like if I just, if I just flip, flip some coins, like plus or minus one, this, this overlap only takes one values. But in some more generic problems, when my P of X may be supported on some interval, then the, these overlaps can take a, a range of values, and you don't want a small value from my estimator to really influence what this overlap is. So I want to isolate the angle for these problems. So that's the intuition why we wanted to understand what the um, joint law was, these models. Uh, I just, um, very nice work, I read it. Um, and I have a ton of questions, of course. Uh, the first one is, so maybe you partially answered to this. Have you tried to extend it to vector spins? So. Oh, um, yes, so I have not done it, and I think it should be done. The main challenge to, to, to go from this to vector spins are, um, you have to go to basically a vector version of um, Kramer's theorem, and that extra step should be doable, but there's a bit of a bit more work that has to be done. And the other main main obstacle that sort of prevents us from going to um, vector spins is well, we now have to just understand the joint laws of many estimates from for for in, instead of only one x zero in the higher rank case, there'll be many x x zero zero sort of factor instance. So I have to understand what the joint laws are. And the nice news about that is the synchronization that was used to understand the classical vector spin models will also work, at, work for these models because things are at the right scale. So we can still add the regularizing perturbation. So I think the main challenge will be, um, will be um, generalizing Cremere's theorem from the vector case or from the scalar case to the vector case and, and making sure that nothing breaks for those. For those, for those okay, problems. and the follow-up question to this is, um, in this um, proof of universality, you need to expand the GY0 in the second argument, right? And to do that, you need that uh, the second entry of this GY uh, is small. Uh, Otherwise, you cannot neglect the further terms. That's, that's right, do that's right. Know, do you know when this, uh, for what kind of uh, rank scaling this breaks down? I see, I see. Um, yeah, so um, the, Fr Fr Francesco's um, com completely um, correct. I need three times the French one also needs some bounds on what these uh, what these um, what these um, are, and it's and it's um, written in paper, and um, um, so when are some examples of some log likelihoods where this will not work? Um, I I can say that it works in I guess models corresponding to stochastic block models and models where it will not work, um, I would assume that maybe if the Y has heavier tails or, or, or something like that, then it, then it will not work since the log of the probabilities might be too, too big. So, so implicit here in the behaviors of this G is sort of some very precise, precise, um, precise or some maybe somewhat res res restrictive conditions on what the log likelihoods can be. So, um, It'll be interesting to see how much we can remove that, but um, I, this is, right now we just, we just uh, assume, assume some are uniform bound on these, on, these, um, on, these, on these derivatives. I have one question as well. So uh, from the formulas that you get at the end, do you get insights from the form of the rate function when uh, do you expect to have concentration 
in this mismatch settings or not? Uh, is there any insights you can extract from this? Yes, yes, that is a very nice, um, nice, um, nice um, question. And it's sort of something that um, we haven't done. And I guess one of the motivations for approving this models, or at least for um, Florent and Mecca, is was was to precisely understand how these overlaps behave in these in these in these models. But um, we just have a ray function now, and we haven't. I haven't done any analysis, but hopefully in, in the future we'll be able to use this to understand to understand what, what you what you mentioned. Or I guess that was why Florent and Menka were um, one of the reasons why 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 they why they were um, why, they, why they were interested in this in this problem. But it's not been done yet. Oh, but it, I think it, it, it has it has been done in 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 in, in some settings by work by by Francesca, I believe. Yes, yes. So, so, um, yeah. So, 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 they just were corresponding to the precisely for the unique, unique minimizer case. Yeah. So, um, they were, they were able to show that these, that these, that these overlaps, overlaps, um, concentrate for these models. Okay. All right. If I don't see other questions, maybe we can go for lunch and thank you again, Justin.